So chapter 20 goes over the brainstem region, and just like chapter 19 with the cranial nerves, there is a ton of information in the book that we are not going to go over. So we're going to talk about the brainstem in terms of its basic, the basic function of its individual parts. So for the learning objectives, I want you to be able to describe the basic functions of brain stem structures, the reticular formation, the pons, the medulla, and the midbrain. Um, I want you to be able to list and define what we call the four D's of brainstem dysfunction. It's kind of handy that um, all of the um, symptoms that are generally um, associated with brainstem dysfunction all start with the letter D, makes it easy to remember. We'll go over those. So the brainstem is superior to the spinal cord and inferior to the cerebrum. It is literally a bridge between the spinal cord and the cerebrum. So from inferior to superior, we have the midbrain, um, which is where most of the cranial nerves um, originate, although some of them originate on the pons and the medulla. And then the pons, uh, I'm sorry, inferior to superior is medulla, pons, midbrain. Um, superior to inferior is midbrain, pons, medulla. So pons means bridge. And medulla is short for medulla oblongata. So you, you think of it as sort of that oblong, um, elongated area at the base of the brainstem, that's the medulla, um, and the midbrain is in the middle of everything. So ways to remember. Um, connections of the cranial nerves, um, there's a 2-4-3 two, three, two, four, three rule, you don't have to remember this, but just in case you ever want to. Um, two cranial nerves connect with midbrain, four connect with the pons, and three connect with the medulla. So um, the two, four, three rule, if you want to remember that. So um, there are sensory, autonomic, and motor vertical tracks that travel through the brainstem. Um, some tracks just continue straight through the brainstem without alteration. The brainstem acts as a conduit. But because of that, if you have an injury to the brainstem, um, it's going to affect a lot of things because stuff's not being transmitted from the cerebrum to the periphery or vice versa. So the reticular formation is um, a complex neural network that includes um, reticular nuclei, and we know that nuclei are groups of neurons with common function, um, the connections of those nuclei, and the ascending and descending reticular pathways. Um, the reticular formation um, integrates sensory and cortical information. So it tells you like what you see and feel and hear and taste and everything with what you remember and processing in the cerebral cortex. Um, the reticular formation also regulates somatic motor activity, autonomic function, and consciousness. So huge. It's a huge, um, important thing. And remember we had that one spinal tract, the spinal reticular tract, that... Um, uh, when your uh, spinal reticular tract is activated, it's alertness and arousal and consciousness. It modulates that nociceptive pain information from the D fibers, the A, um, sorry, the A delta fibers. Um, it also regulates neural activity throughout the central nervous system. So that's part of its keeping track of your um, arousal and alertness, if that makes sense. So um, the part that regulates your consciousness is called the ascending reticular activating system, or ARAS. Um, consciousness is our awareness of self and surroundings. Um, and our consciousness system governs alertness, sleep, and attention. Um, brainstem components of the ascending reticular activating system are the reticular formation and the um, ARAS. So this is... Um, this is what is activated when we're getting that incoming nociceptive data that's keeping us awake at night. My knee hurts and I can't sleep. My shoulder hurts and I can't sleep. It's keeping us awake and alert because it's like something's wrong. We need to deal with this. And a lot of times all it does is make you grumpy. And then you come into PT and complain about how you can't sleep at night. <laughs> but sleep is a big important part to healing. So there you go. It's keeping us alert. Um, the, the other part of the reticular system is 
that consciousness, that awareness of self and surroundings. So, and integrating sensory information with cerebral information. So, um, I sort of, um, there's a couple of um, videos in the module that you can look at um, that talk about reticulating activating system, which is kind of, they're kind of interesting. You don't really need to know the information specifically, but sometimes just integrating this like, oh, I'm, I'm getting a big picture of what's going on. Um, so like say that uh, this has probably happened to some of you say that you just got a new car and it's a um, silver Toyota I'm just gonna say it's a silver silver Toyota Camry and all of a sudden you're driving around and you notice that there are tons of silver Toyota Camry's in town and you're like why didn't I ever notice these before well because you've got the sensory and the cerebral information of having bought this new car you're now more aware of it and you're more aware of it in your surroundings and that is the reticular activating system sort of coordinating that sensory information that you're getting in through the visual system and your um, cerebral information of having just bought that new Camry um, and now you're way more aware of all the Camrys in your surroundings um, sort of a body example of this is a um, an acquaintance of mine had um, uh, was in for a regular doctor's checkup and they wanted um, they wanted them to do a um, cardiac a echocardiogram because because of some results that showed up and they weren't having any symptoms that they could detect they went for the echocardiogram and they found some abnormality in the, in her in her heart well after that she said she felt like she was having chest pains and it's it's more like you might have been having some minor chest pains before, but now you're more aware of it. You're conscious of it and you're alert to it. Um, so just like having that little input makes you more aware of sensory um, things and things that are going on in your surroundings. So the reticular activating system is complicated, but does a lot of interesting things for us. So it's fun to just kind of um, check out that stuff in our environment and um, see how it works in our day-to-day -day life. The medulla contributes to controlling head and eye movements, important stuff there, coordinating swallowing, hugely important, and regulating cardiovascular, respiratory, and visceral activity. Um, yeah, vital functions, <laughs> very, very important. So um, there are lots and lots of little um, nuclei in the medulla which are um, listed on this diagram of a cross-section of the medulla. Do I expect you to know those? No, I do not. Um, but someday you'll decide you want to take an advanced um, neuroanatomy class and then you'll be looking at that. Um, the pons or bridge processes motor information from the cerebral cortex and forwards the information to the cerebellum. So the pons is sort of an, an enlarged area when you get out of the medulla, and um, when you when you see um, diagrams or when you actually look at the brain, or you see uh, myelin stains, there are tons of um, axons coming out of the pons, going to the cerebellum, and they actually go into the cerebellar peduncles, which are those. Um, groups of axons that are processing all that information that the cerebellum processes. Um, the pontine um, cranial nerve nuclei process sem sensory information from the face, um, cranial nerve 5, and control contraction of muscles involved in processing that sensation from the face, lateral movement of the eye, and chewing. So um, again, lots of sort of vital functions there, plus all that information going back and forth to the cerebellum. The midbrain is the uppermost part of the brainstem. Um, it connects the diencephalon and the pons. So the diencephalon we'll talk about um, in a couple chapters, um, but includes the thalamus and a lot of other important structures. And so the midbrain is um, sort of the bridge between the pons and the um, diencephalon. The cerebral aqueduct, which is where the um, CSF flows, is a small canal through the midbrain and it joins the third and fourth ventricles. So in the cross section you'll see that cerebral aqueduct right in the middle. So lots of um, some areas that you might recognize some of the spinal cord tracts are going through the midbrain, the spinothalamic tract, 
the uh, medial lemniscus after the dorsal column passes on the information. Um, so lots of um, tracks that you might recognize that are coming up from the spinal cord, and then um, some other some other areas that um, we're not going to talk about. <laughs> that makes it easy, right? So the cerebellum we already talked about in its own little chapter, but just as a review, um, the cerebellar function is entirely dependent on input and output connections with the brainstem. So that's all those connections with the pons. The cerebellum and brainstem um, are crammed into a tightly confined space of the posterior fossa of the cranium. Um, so cerebellar function, just to review, it, um, coordination of movement, motor planning, and cognitive functions, including rapid shifts of attention. So it needs all that input from the brainstem input and output to um, do all those things. So the um, disorders of the brainstem region, because the brainstem region involves a lot of these vital functions and being a bridge for a lot of those spinal tracts, um, disorders of the brainstem can be hugely debilitating. So um, evaluating the functions of cranial nerves and vertical tracts can localize lesions within the brainstem. Um, so that's what I was in the cranial nerve section. I briefly talked about some of the tests they do to test cranial nerves. So a lot of times they're looking, is there a lesion in the brainstem area? Um, so because we, of that 2, 4, 3 arrangement of the cranial nerves, you can localize where the lesion is in the brainstem. But a single brainstem lesion may cause a mix of ipsilateral and contralateral signs because the tracts cross over at different areas. So some tracts cross over um, before the brainstem, some cross over after the brainstem, and some cross over in the brainstem. So um, the uh, laterality of signs doesn't necessarily pinpoint the brainstem lesion. Um, brainstem lesions uh, are the um, mix of uh, contralateral and ipsilateral signs occur because the cranial nerves supply the ipsilateral face and neck, and many of the vertical tracts cross the midline in the brainstem to supply the contralateral body. So um, you get that mix of um, signs. Lesions in the brainstem can also interfere with vital functions and consciousness. Um, that is very important. That's why it's in red. So disruption of vital functions, secondary to brainstem damage, can cause the heart to stop beating, the blood pressure to fluctuate uncontrollably, and breathing to cease. Hugely important things. Areas in the medulla and pons regulate these vital functions, and so um, having a damage in those areas can be life-threatening. The four Ds of brainstem dysfunction, cardinal signs, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, dysarthria, which is difficulty in speaking, diplopia, which is double vision, and dysmetria, which is inability to control the distance of movements. So you should memorize those. That would be a good thing to memorize. Four Ds of brainstem dysfunction. Um, states of altered consciousness may occur with lesions either to the brainstem or the cerebrum um, because of all those vital functions that it controls. Brainstem damage affecting reticular formation or axons in the ARAS interferes with consciousness. So sometimes when someone has um, trauma and they're in a coma, it's because the brainstem is damaged. Damage to the cerebrum interfering with hypothalamic or thalamic activating areas or within the function of the entire cerebral cortex um, may also impair consciousness. So you can be in a coma because you have brainstem damage. You can also be in a coma from cerebral damage. So um, consciousness is uh, one of those things that um, the lesions to the brainstem can um, interrupt vital functions to the point where you are dead or in a coma. So ischemia in the brainstem usually produces an abrupt onset of neurological symptoms including dizziness, visual disorders like diplopia, um, weakness in coordination, and somatosensory disorders because all those tracks go through the brainstem. Um, vertebra, the uh, vertebrobasilar artery is what supplies the brainstem and um, 
insufficiency of that artery, artery can produce transient symptoms of brainstem region ischemia when the neck is extended and rotated. So when they, if your neck is extended and rotated and you get dizziness and double vision and weakness and that sort of thing, um, yeah, that's go to the ER. That's serious.